Very handy. Well, we'll just give folks a minute. I know on these Facebook live chats, uh, it takes a few minutes for people to connect. Um, but super excited to be here with you today, David, talking about sea turtles. Absolutely. And we picked the perfect day for it as well. <laughs> Coincidentally, yep. you didn't even know when we scheduled this on World Sea Turtle Day. That's right. I, like, I, I think it's the universe, you know, somehow we're just connected. What's the saying about you, you pick up one thing and you find it's connected to everything? Who said that? It's a famous environmentalist. I, I'm um, not sure about that one. <laughs> It's like you pick, you, 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 you touch one thing in the universe and you find that it's connected to everything. So somehow I think we're, I we think just that's must the be universal connected. truth with everything. That's true. That's true. Um, well, so we'll get started here. Um, and just so you know, David, um, as folks uh, enter a little, you know, they may enter questions on the chat and Carson's going to help us out um, in, in navigating some of those questions. Yeah, but would love to um, kick us off here uh, for folks who are viewing now. I'm Aliki Moncrief. I'm the executive director of Florida Conservation Voters. And I couldn't be more excited uh, than to be joined here today with David Godfrey, who is the executive director of the Sea Turtle Conservancy, um, which is an incredible organization founded more than 50 years ago and is really the leading voice for sea turtle conservation and research in Florida. Um, so David, so happy to have you. Would you like to maybe start us off with a little bit more about your organization, the history? Absolutely. So um, uh, it, it's the truth that the Sea Turtle Conservancy is actually the world's first sea turtle conservation group. Uh, we were founded in 1959, um, uh, largely by Dr. Archie Carr, who mm -hmm. any, anyone in the world who works with sea turtles has heard of Dr. Carr. He was in his life the, the leading authority on sea turtles. He was a University of Florida professor um, and much more. He was an incredible author and, and scientist and really raised the global alarm about what was happening with sea turtles at that time. And that started a movement that, uh, that began with the formation of our organization mm -hmm. and has really spread around the world. Uh, so yeah, we celebrated celebrated our 60th anniversary last oh. year. Oh wow, that's incredible! It Six is decades. I well, I know we're super grateful for the work that that you all have been doing, um, and we'd love to know. After six decades of working such focused effort on sea turtle conservation, how are sea turtles doing? Uh, how are their populations doing? Well, it, it depends on where you look, but if I could summarize, I could say that they're they're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. And um, we've learned over the decades that sea turtles can be saved. Um, it takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are plenty of threats on the horizon. And I know in a little bit we're going to start talking about climate change and some of its long-term impacts. So there are, there are many unknowns. But if you take a snapshot right now and say, how are turtles doing compared to when we started our work in the 1950s, um, there are a lot of laws and regulations in place protecting them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of awareness. There are uh, national parks established for them all over the world. Um, right here in Florida, we have the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge named after our founder. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of good things to say about turtles and their numbers especially in Florida, are doing pretty good. That's great. Um, green turtles are growing exponentially in their, their population. Um, leatherbacks, it's a little hard to say. It's kind of up and down, but they're at least holding steady. Mm -hmm. uh, and loggerheads appear to be growing a little bit as well. So That's incredible. Pretty good news, at least here and, and uh, in many other parts of the world, but bad news here and there as well. But, um, you know, I like to celebrate the good. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely celebrate celebrate the good. Um, and again, it's I think it's in large part to the work of of Sea Turtle Conservancy um, over these years to make sure that sea turtles are doing well. Um, so, what would you say, you know, for folks who are watching, um, what what would you say are the biggest threats uh, that are facing turtles in in Florida and in, in the larger area, the Caribbean, kind of our region? Sure. Well, in Florida, I think the main issues, of course, re relate back to us, to people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our behavior. Um, you know, we uh, most people don't intend to hurt turtles. 
Um, it's a byproduct of the way that we live and where we live and some of the things we do for recreation. Mm -hmm. But um, our impact on their habitat, uh, largely from coastal construction, mm -hmm. is, is a significant threat. Um, we, we encroach on their habitat. We alter um, the night sky. Mm -hmm. um, turtles depend on dark beaches and we've, in most places and many places around Florida, we've lit up the beach at night with, with uh, artificial light. Um, there are lots of boats in our, in our near shore waters and the very places where turtles live and grow up. And so we see a lot of, you know, strandings every year, turtles washing ashore with the telltale signs of having been struck by a boat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it's a lot of things. And then of course, you know, it's in the news a lot uh, plastics and, and how our use of plastics and, and not controlling that the waste stream properly ends up with lots of things entering the marine environment and turtles can get hung up in it mm -hmm. or ingest it. Um, and as plastic breaks apart into smaller and smaller little pieces out there in the environment, even, even hatchlings, newborn turtles are out there floating around uh, in sargassum mats that are filled with little pieces of plastic that mm. look like food. Right. So um, that's a growing problem as well. Yeah. Well, to kind of hone in on one of the problems, and you, you mentioned it, you know, where we live, living along the coastline, that's where turtles obviously um, need, that, that's the habitat they need to survive. Um, how, I mean, we're, we're, we're just starting hurricane season. Um, and so coastal considerations, I think are top of mind for people. How do you feel, how do you feel about, you know, the impact of hurricanes, impact of storms, impact of sea level rise, you mentioned it on, on sea turtle conservation. Sure. Well, in general, um, sea turtles have evolved over a hundred million years um, to deal with calamitous, you know, natural uh, phenomenon like hurricanes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they produce uh, a lot of young, uh, a lot of, you know, every nest has around a hundred eggs in it. Wow. Um, so there's an opportunity for a lot of young turtles to join the population every year. Um, and that, uh, that strategy for survival, producing a lot of young Mm -hmm. um, is one way to deal with the fact that there are a lot of threats to that life phase, whether mm -hmm. it's predation or um, hurricanes that, that will wipe out, you know, large sections of the nesting uh, productivity on particular beaches. Mm -hmm. So in general, hurricanes aren't um, really a, 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 a threat at the population level. Mm -hmm. It may diminish the numbers of, of hatchlings in a given year, Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily going to um, alter the survivability of, of sea turtles because they're they're constantly reproducing. It you know hurricanes don't wipe out all the the nests around Florida just in whatever area right. you know, comes ashore where, where there's the most erosion. But it's also true that we seem to be seeing um, more hurricanes. We seem mm -hmm. to be seeing stronger hurricanes, and on top of that, you have the um, uh, the growing problem of sea level rise mm -hmm. and the fact that people have developed much of our coastline in Florida mm -hmm. and essentially or literally drawn a line in the sand and yeah. said, this is where we're going to live. You know, nothing shall pass. Right. Well, the sea is coming, the storms come and it erodes away the sand the dunes, the vegetation, which is what sea turtles need in order to reproduce. Mm -hmm. and, and people respond to that loss of the sand by unfortunately uh, uh, building seawalls, putting out rock revetments, um, using various types of hard engineering um, in a futile effort to hold back the sea. Mm -hmm. So sea turtles are kind of squeezed into that thin ribbon of sand between rising seas and, and stronger storms and people doing more and more to reinforce uh, the shoreline to protect private property. Right, so in our efforts, as you said, to battle the sea, uh, we are contributing to squeezing out sea turtles from that narrow space that they really uh, depend on to survive. 
What about um, what about warming uh, oceans, warming sea temperatures that people read about? Is that having an effect? I mean, how does that play into sea turtle survival? That too, that too is a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the warming of the seas contributes to the sea level rise. Mm -hmm. It also is affecting uh, the 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 ecosystems that sea turtles depend on in the marine environment. Right. So, of course, there's lots of information out there about the impacts to coral reefs. We see bleaching of coral reefs all over the world, certainly here in Florida, in the Florida Keys. Um, reefs are are in jeopardy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they are endangered mm -hmm. um, because of climate change. So that's a problem. And, and hawksbill turtles in particular depend on thriving coral reefs in order to survive. Um, and even seagrasses uh, are disappearing in many parts of the world. Um, and in part because of rising temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, but another interesting phenomenon with sea turtles is that the sex of a hatchling is determined by the temperature at which the, the nest incubates. Right. So warmer incubation temperatures tend to produce mostly, or in some cases, all female hatchlings. Wow. And so there's this kind of pivotal temperature that if it's too warm, and, and we're seeing this all over the world, including here in Florida, where it looks like the uh, most of the hatchlings being produced on some beaches are all female. Huh. And that, of course, has population implications. Absolutely. You're, it's an imbalance. It's another uh, imbalance that we're creating um, in, in sea turtle populations. Right. Well, when it comes to, um, I mean, we talked about a little bit about the warming waters, impacts of those warming waters uh, on coral reefs. What's, what are your thoughts of, you know, I'm sure you remember the BP deep water uh, spill, which was just 10 years ago. It feels like a lifetime ago, but it was only a decade ago. Correct. Um, can you speak a little bit about impacts uh, that you saw on sea turtles with, with the, the BP disaster? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there are still impacts that are being studied. You know, so much oil and, and the chemicals that were used to treat the oil were introduced to that environment that scientists are still uncovering information about how it impacted different ecosystems, especially uh, on the bottom of the sea floor. Mm -hmm. But we, we do know uh, that um, tens of thousands, possibly as many as 100,000 or more, uh, sea turtles are are estimated to have been killed as a direct result of that spill. Wow. So when you know the the federal agencies um, begin to look at the impacts of the spill and to, and to hold BP and some of the other parties responsible mm -hmm. um, with various penalties, uh, criminal and civil penalties for um, uh, being um, you know culpable by that spill. Uh, they had to direct financial compensation to, in order to mitigate for all that harm. Mm -hmm. And sea turtles were one of the really identifiable um, uh, living resources impacted by the spill. Mm -hmm. so, so through this day, there are federal agencies as well as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which received a portion of that penalty money mm -hmm. uh, paid by BP. And that money is being directed at all sorts of uh, research, conservation, education programs with the goal of mitigating the harm from that spill. So there is some some good that has come from it. Yeah. Well, so 10 years later, though, we're still mitigating the harm that came from it. I mean, what do you see as a, as a solution? What do we need to do as far as even now there's discussion at the federal level about expanding drilling? off the coast of Florida. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to know what you think about that. Well, I'd like to keep it as far away from Florida as I can. And, and I don't necessarily want to wish it on anybody's coastline. You know, mm -hmm. um, offshore drilling is just such a risky and dangerous and dirty thing. Um, it, it's not my expertise, but mm -hmm. but you, you hear about so much uh, oil being leaked all the time. We know about the BP spill, but there are all kinds of little spills happening all the time, mm -hmm. uh, which is simply not good mm -hmm. at all for uh, for our coastal and marine and, uh, marine ecosystems. And Florida depends so much on our beaches and our our coastal resources 
Um, there's no other state that is defined by its beaches as much as Florida is. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the prospect of putting that at risk um, for sea turtles, for shorebirds, for recreational and commercial fishing, and for our way of life mm -hmm. and tourism in Florida, it's just a, a risk that's not worth allowing to happen. So we're very much against oil drilling off the coast of Florida. Well, yeah, and that's great. I mean, how how important is Florida also to sea turtle populations worldwide? Um, incredibly important. You know, mm -hmm. I, I give a statistic uh, to people a lot of times and they, they almost can't believe it. But um, in the United States, um, over 90% of all sea turtle nesting occurs in Florida. Wow. Um, I'm going to buckle my seatbelt for that yeah. for that factoid. <laughs> that includes Hawaii. You know, people think of Hawaii and they think of all the turtles in Hawaii. Even including the nesting that's in Hawaii, 90% oh. is here in Florida. I mean, there are other important places in Central America, uh, in Mexico, so, certainly other areas of the tropical world, um, the tropical environments around the world. But um, in in this hemisphere, in the in the Western Atlantic. Florida is incredibly important and, and really the most important place in the world for loggerheads. Um, wow. The most common turtle we see in Florida are loggerhead turtles. Mm -hmm. And if you live on the coastline, uh, especially anywhere on the East Coast, you're bound to have seen loggerhead turtles nesting and, and maybe even quite a few of them. And mm -hmm. you think, well, wow, these animals are plentiful. Look how many we have. Uh, they're not endangered or threatened in any way. They're, they're all over the place. There is no other place on the entire planet that has a leatherback nest, or excuse me, loggerhead nesting like we have in Florida. So it's very, very important. Well, so we, I mean, the people in Florida then have really been entrusted in a way with an incredibly special resource. And, and I mean, I, I struggle to think about turtles as resources, honestly, because they're incredible animals. Um, but we've been entrusted with this incredible responsibility. What do you see as some, some proactive solutions uh, that we can implement here in Florida to, to make sure that we're stepping up and, and um, you know, taking on that responsibility of protecting them? Well, one thing, a really positive thing to be aware of is that um, Lots of Floridians know about sea turtles and, and are very passionate mm -hmm. about sea turtles. Um, uh, I have a sea turtle license plate. I was just <laughs> about I think you might have had something to do with. <laughs> so, yes, the Sea Turtle Conservancy um, uh, designed that tag, um, worked with legislators to get uh, legislation introduced to establish the tag. Um, we're responsible for the marketing of it, and we manage the Sea Turtle Grants Program, mm -hmm. which is funded by 30% of the proceeds uh, from the tag. So we're able to give that money back to county governments, to universities, and to nonprofits all over the state of Florida working with sea turtles. And I think there are close to 150 specialty tags available in Florida right now. Mm -hmm. The Sea Turtle Tag is the number two seller. Wow. The only one that sells more is the University of Florida and we're creeping up on them. <laughs> so turtles are popular and people support turtle conservation with dollars by purchasing that tag. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a, a good bit of news. Um, but it's also important that we hold our elected officials at the county level, the municipal level, and certainly the state level, hold them to task for making sure that we are um, giving sea turtles a chance for long-term survival. Mm -hmm. you know, um, there, there are good things happening in terms of efforts to manage lights in Florida. Um, there, there, are, there are efforts underway now to establish a statewide habitat conservation plan that would guide state permitting for things that happen on the beach mm -hmm. and really try to minimize the impacts to turtles. Um, but we really aren't dealing with the long-term ramifications of sea level rise mm -hmm. at, at any level of state government. We just have not come to terms in Florida with how much that's going to impact our coastline. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be preparing for that now. Um, we are not going to be able to put walls up or continue to pump sand on the beaches forever. Right. It's a losing prospect. 
we need to think more creatively about how we respond to what is coming. Um, and so, people need to be aware of it. Yeah, on, on that front, what do you feel like is the role of, I mean, I know you're familiar um, with you know, Florida Forever, many of the important um, land conservation programs, uh, the Water and Land Conservation Amendment that passed back in 2014, you know, yes. stood up and said, yes, we want to see investments in, in conservation. And some of that money over the last five years of the amendment has gone to beach restoration. So what do you see as the role of um, you know, those, those land conservation, public financing type of um, strategies for sea turtle conservation? Well, certainly um, one of the best things you can do to protect resources anywhere is to buy the land and, and, and have it be in public ownership. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm also pragmatic enough to understand how expensive beachfront property is. Mm -hmm. um, th that there are strategic ways to allocate dollars for buying habitat on the beachfront, particularly in areas where the alternative might be to, to introduce seawalls, to, mm -hmm. to harden the shoreline. You know, there are plenty of places in the state where it's made up of older homes, mom and pop motels, and rather than seeing those converted into large multifamily high-rise uh, apartments and condos, um, if they begin to be threatened by the sea or erosion or are damaged significantly by storms, boy, it'd be nice to purchase that land mm -hmm. and, and bring it into public ownership. And, and in that way, sort of strategically retreat from the coast in some areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to retreat from the coast uh, eventually. Yeah. Uh, but doing it strategically over time uh, is, is, I think, a wiser way to approach it. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Can you talk a little bit, you know, I think within the conservation community and the, maybe the, the public at large, I feel like there are some, there's some confusion um, about beach renourishment. Um, and I know that we've often relied on Sea Turtle Conservancy for the, the, the best knowledge and science-based information to talk about those issues. So can you share a little bit about what beach renourishment like how that plays a role in sea turtle conservation? Right. Well, um, it, it's a complex issue, mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at the erosion that's occurring on developed shorelines, and, and, and you could pick almost any beachfront community and find areas where there has development has been allowed to happen mm -hmm. uh, close to the high tide line, or just erosion has transpired over the decades mm -hmm. and brought the high tide line close to existing development. Mm -hmm. And when you have storms or, or erosion starts to get close to or, or is actually beginning to undermine foundations, mm -hmm. um, you have some immediate choices that need to be made uh, by property owners. Uh, are you going to go get a permit to build a massive seawall that extends all the way down the beach in front of yours and maybe 20 properties down the beach. Mm -hmm. So we slowly wall in the coastline, cut off sea turtles and shorebirds and beach mice and any, uh, many other critters from access to healthy dune habitat. Mm -hmm. Or do we come in and say, at least now, until we come up with another solution, mm -hmm. do we try to replace sand and, and recreate as much of a, a natural uh, beachfront environment as we can. Mm -hmm. and, and that is certainly the lesser of a number of not other great choices. Right. So, I mean, dredging sand from offshore, pumping it onto the beach, using, you know, heavy machinery to spread it back and forth. Um, it's, it's dredge and fill, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, um, a substantial construction activity on a beach that you know, changes the beach profile. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not immediately a, a thriving ecosystem when you, you know, do that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is an alternative that is certainly better for sea turtles. Right. Um, it can be much better for shorebirds. And there's a way to do it where you are, rather than creating very long, flat beaches that extend, you know, way out into the water, um, you're, they're a little bit shorter. You're using really good beach quality sand. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good slope to it. 
Uh, maybe you're rebuilding some dunes and introducing uh, native dune vegetation. There's a way, there's a good way to mm -hmm. rebuild beaches in this state that is a whole lot better for conservation and for people uh, and our use of the beach than seawalls. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so if you, I, I think when we were chatting before this call, I like to think of, you know, magic wands. I often wish I had a magic wand. <laughs> so if you had a magic wand, uh, what would you say is like, just in the short term, the most important thing that, that can be done in Florida, uh, the most important thing to protect sea turtles in a short term, knowing that it's complicated. Yeah. There's lots of solutions that we have to employ. There's never a silver bullet. I got yeah. all those caveats. <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to pick one. Yeah. Um, and there are several ways to, I, I have to at least give two. Okay, two's good. <laughs> so one of the ways that, that an organization like STC um, looks at sea turtle issues in Florida is what are the biggest sources of mortality, mm -hmm. right? What's, what's killing turtles the mm -hmm. most? And, and there are several uh, causes, but one of them is uh, artificial beachfront lighting, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. Um, we've lit up the coast and, and what happens in a nutshell is hatchlings come out of their nest and they go the wrong way. They're attracted to the light, um, which makes them incredibly vulnerable to predation. They get run over in roads. Um, you know, estimates, you know, are in, certainly in the tens of thousands of hatchlings are disoriented every year in, in Florida alone. Mm -hmm. So there are some really good uh, strategies for addressing that. The incredible technologies have been developed over the last 10 years of sea turtle friendly lighting and fixtures that use um, uh, uh, LED lights in the longer wavelength. Mm -hmm. So to you and I, it may look slightly orangish in color, um, but it's very pleasing to the eyes at night. You can see great in it. Mm -hmm. um, there are not security issues or safety issues for human beings in this light, but hatching turtles don't respond to it. They mm -hmm. go to the water. And so uh, a number like invisible of- Invisible to them. I don't know invisible, <laughs> but, but they, they, it, it doesn't register as that's the direction I should go. Gotcha. Right? So um, uh, Sea Turtle Conservancy, one of the things we've been doing with some of that BP uh, restitution money is working with beachfront property owners, uh, particularly on the Gulf Coast, to retrofit their lights to sea turtle friendly lighting. Now, we could never have enough money to do that everywhere in Florida and correct all the problems. Mm -hmm. But at the property owner level, they can. Mm -hmm. uh, we can help them do it. The State of Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has great resources online. So does our organization. Um, incorporating sea turtle friendly lighting all over the coast would save lots of turtles. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And the other one is we need to begin thinking uh, more strategically about the long-term management of our coastline mm -hmm. and minimizing our impacts to it. Um, the state of Florida and the permits that are granted for anything that happens on the beach, those permits need to think long-term about the implications of what's being allowed to happen. And so STC and others and the state of Florida have been working together for 10 years uh, to develop a habitat conservation plan, mm -hmm. an HCP, uh, that will address impacts to sea turtles, as well as beach mice, as well as shorebirds. And it's one of the most complex uh, HCPs anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. And it is because it addresses multiple species. Mm -hmm. uh, and that HCP needs to be adopted. It's in its final phase. Um, you know, uh, Governor DeSantis and our legislature need to go ahead and get it done and implement it. And that's one of the things we can really do to make an impact for turtles. That's great. Is it is part of the reason for why the HCP is so complicated is because it covers the entire, I mean, all of the coastlines in Florida as well, the, just the scope of it? It covers all permitting under the, the Coastal Construction Control Line permitting program. Okay. And it also covers three different categories of species. Wow. Sea turtles, birds, and mice. Um, so maybe even some others, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if they'd add some more. Yeah. But, uh, we're, we're particularly focused on the, the, uh, the, the, the ways that they're trying to limit impacts to turtles in particular. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's uh, a lot of work has gone into it. Um, frankly, millions of dollars have gone into developing this plan mm -hmm. and it's basically ready to go. That's um, great. Yeah, and it so just, it's just it's waiting. Really it's waiting for the thumbs up from Governor DeSantis and the legislature. Correct. Well, we've got just a couple minutes uh, left and I want to note um, folks have been chiming in in the comment stream. Uh, Blair just mentioned um, that one of the most important things that uh, a conservation minded voter can do is to vote to protect the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. And the Habitat Conservation Plan that you just discussed, David, I think is a great example, as Blair points out, of yes. the Endangered Species Act working really well. Yes. Um, a lot of folks in the chat um, noting that yes, we've got to we've got to make sure that we're electing lawmakers who are going to stand up for turtles, uh, stand up for our coastlines. Yeah. Um, interesting. That, that's also how we save the Endangered Species Act. Yes. You and I don't get to vote on the Endangered Species Act. Right. We vote on the people who vote on the act. Right. And we need those people to understand why it's so important. Absolutely, voting matters. Elections have consequences. They have consequences for people, for sea turtles, for our environment. Absolutely. Um, also noting, uh, have, uh, let's see, I skipped it here. H Helen is noting um, that, yes, she's chiming in in support, electing. She, she actually is sharing exactly what you were sharing, David. So we're all on the same wavelength here. Um, other than that, uh, just wanted to highlight those few comments. Um, there's a there's a there's a sort of a micro question here about filling in holes when you go to the beach. Is that something important that people need to keep in mind, David? It is. You know, you wouldn't think that your kids going to the beach and digging a big hole and building a sandcastle is necessarily that big of a deal. I mean, we mm -hmm. all grew up in Florida doing that. Mm -hmm. But if you've come out and walked on the beach early in the morning and seen a a, a 300 pound female turtle stuck upside down in a hole mm -hmm. that some people left on the beach, you realize how calamitous that can be to turtles. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't take that much to fill the hole back in. Right. You know, have your fun during the day. The turtles are gonna come out at night. So let's leave them a good, healthy beach. And that's removing our plastic, removing our beach furniture mm -hmm. and filling in holes. Yeah. Well, so we'll we'll end on that note. It's been really great uh, talking with you, David. You know, I think the take home message is there's there are some really simple things that people can do, like filling in holes, making sure that you're not littering on the beach, um, making sure that you're not leaving equipment, beach chairs, et cetera, on the beach. And another simple thing that doesn't feel simple maybe for folks is to make sure that that you go out and vote. <laughs> uh, because it, it, at the end of the day, it is our elected lawmakers who are gonna be uh, having the most influence on the long-term survival of, of sea turtles. Um, yeah. So can't thank you enough, David, for taking some time, especially knowing that it's World Sea Turtle Day. I feel so incredibly lucky uh, that we got to have this time with you. Um, wish you the best and love working with you in the future um, on all the incredible work that Sea Turtle Conservancy is doing here in Florida and beyond. Thanks, Leaky. Thanks for letting us uh, get this message out on this important day. It's also Archie Carr's birthday. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we wish him a happy birthday and, yeah. and uh, celebrate World Sea Turtle Day. And thanks for all the support. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.